All right, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. We are uh, looking forward to a great time together with Bishop Jamie Englehart. Good to see Deborah Adcock joining us this, this evening from Tulsa. Uh, and there's already a whole lot of folks uh, that are watching that haven't actually got into the chat room, which is totally fine. Uh, you don't have to be in. Uh, David Jacobs, our board member, is joining us this evening. He just got off of work here in the offices and went home to watch. Um, and Dr. Faye is watching, my wife. Um, Daniel Bishop, Apostle Daniel Williams is watching us tonight. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, go ahead and get started. And as you come on, I'll try to keep up with the chat room. But if I can't, then I'll catch up with you after the show. Uh, uh, Apostle Gary Barker is watching from uh, uh, back east. Uh, good to see you. Um, and so, uh, Bishop Jamie, I'm glad to see you back on Kingdom Dynamics. Welcome, my brother. How are you? Thank you. It's good to be here. Always an honor, my friend. Yes. And I think this is only the second time you've been on, but um, I'm looking forward to this. As tonight, we're going to talk about what is the gospel and why do we preach it? And I know there's a lot of, uh, of uh, not necessarily controversy, but there's a lot of uh, focus on the gospel that Paul preached. And some people think that is the gospel, the only gospel. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, so let's jump right into this. And I'll go ahead and read Romans 1 verses uh, 13 through 17, and then uh, maybe a comment or two, and I'm going to, to turn this over to you and let you talk and uh, just chime in every now and then. But this says in the New King James, now I do not want you to become unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also just as other, among others, uh, the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as for, uh, as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I know there are other translations that probably give us a, a better spread of, of wording and, and meaning. But, um, you know, it's amazing to me, Bishop, that on the road to Damascus, this man by the name of Saul had this life-changing experience. And for me, who has uh, uh, studied uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that Paul has written, I'm glad he had that experience. So so uh, was Paul apprehensive about preaching the gospel in Rome? And I just kind of throw that out there as we get going. Uh, no, I, I don't think he was appre uh, like apprehensive at all. I think uh, he was hindered uh, in one way or another to just uh, to go there to preach it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think it had anything to do with uh, him not wanting to go. Matter of fact, uh, what he was warned by was it Agabus? You know, and pretty much, hey, if you go there, this is what's going to happen to you. And Paul's like, I'm more. I'm more than willing uh, to, <laughs> go, to go to go into the belly of the beast, if you may, and uh, and share the good news. So yeah, yeah. So you were telling me before the show what the gospel is as it's laid out, and I'm not going to say how many or what. I'm just going to let you run with it. Sure. Uh, I mean, first of all, the, the passage you read is exactly back here a few years ago. I went on a went on a two month sabbatical. It's the first time done that I've been preaching, traveling full time at that time up to twenty, I think, almost twenty eight years. And finally took a little time off and should have, should have did it at least every seven to 10 years. I'm, I'm learning my lesson now. But while I was on that sabbatical and just reading, Romans 1 just kept being stirred in me. And, and I tell you what jumped off the page at me was Paul saying to believers, or he's, he's Romans, he's writing a letter. He's not writing a letter to pagans. He's not writing a letter to unbelievers. He's telling believers, I long to come to you so that I can preach the gospel to you. But then he tells us, that he wanted to come preach the gospel of Christ to them. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, what jumped off the page at me is, is, first of all, why would Paul 
need to preach the gospel to people who have already heard the gospel. Because, you know, part, part of our issue in the Western world, I mean, you know, if you've been in church for any amount of time or in the kingdom, you know, if I were, if, if I were to say, you know what, um, uh, tomorrow I'm going to go with a pastor friend of mine and we're going to go downtown Louisville. That's where we, we live in the Louisville area. We're going to go downtown Louisville to preach the gospel to people on the streets. Uh, most people's mind would immediately go to, well, they're going to go try to get people saved. You know, they're going to go try to get people converted. They're going to try to get people from darkness to light uh, to come into the kingdom, to get people born again. We, whatever language or verbiage, uh, sure. that you, depending on your background that you came out of in church. But we, we tend to limit the idea of the gospel to something that people do when they walk down an aisle and they pray, and it tends to be all focused on the afterlife. And so we preach the gospel because we're trying to get people, uh, you know, from one place to another place, out of hell into heaven, you know, from darkness to light. I mean, whatever language you want to use, and, you know, we've all, we've all probably been turned or burn preachers at one time or another, and then, you know, God, sure. <laughs> God had to show us, I ain't about any of that. I don't even know where you get that. You know, but I think then what happens, though, is then we put such a focus uh, because he says it's the power of God unto salvation, unto sozo. Yes, well, there's not one ounce of sozo we need in heaven. So th th this has nothing to do with going to heaven. All right. So, you know, I mean, I don't need to be I don't need to be saved in heaven. I need salvation here. I don't need healing in heaven. I need healing here. I don't need deliverance in heaven. I need deliverance here. I don't need prosperity, wholeness, completeness protection, everything that sozo and soteria mean, none of that when it comes to our soteriology, when it comes to salvation, do we need in heaven? Uh, you know, it's like a friend of mine and I, we've said this for years, that we've taught people how to, all about the sweet by and by, not taught them how to live in the nasty now and now. And the truth yeah. is salvation is more about this life. So Paul is saying, I want to come preach the gospel to you because the gospel is the power of God unto your healing, your deliverance your prosperity, your wholeness. That means the gospel is bigger than just, uh, I get to go somewhere when I die, or I get to finally be with Jesus. And so uh, I think because we've limited the gospel to just the idea, uh, many times again, of the afterlife, I think we have limited, uh, we, we've limited the, the aspect and the power of what the gospel is all about. You know, I remember when I was a kid, remember I said to my parents, I was about, I think, 10 years old, and we were having a dinner, and my, my parents pastored 53 years. And uh, I remember I looked at my mom and dad, and I said, I, you know, listen, I love Jesus, but I'm not that excited to go to heaven. And, and my mom and dad were horrified. You know, they're like, you know, son, don't say anything like that. Why would you say something like that? And I'm like, well, you know, I guess I like the idea of no sickness and no pain and no tears, which, of course, you know, we – that are speaking, you know, we, we know that's talking about the new covenant. It's not, it's not talking about necessarily heaven, but we didn't know that then. Yeah. And I said, you know, as, as a 10 year old boy, I heard heaven preach. I love the idea of a place of no pain and no sickness. Uh, but then it seemed like all we were going to do for all of eternity was sing. You know, I mean, we're just going to join with angels and just forever and ever and ever and ever, we're going to bow saying, holy, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy. And I remember sitting there thinking as a kid, we used to have marathon Sunday night services that would go five or six hours. And at six, seven, eight years old, I was made to sit in a wooden pew and not move. I said, that ain't heaven. That's hell. You know, I mean, I, 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 I'm like, if all we're going to do is go to heaven and have one big, long church service, you know, at 10 years old, I was like, I'm not interested. That doesn't sound that fun to me. Yeah. But, you know, because yeah. then my mind was like, well, what are we going to rule and reign? And, 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 you know, what did Jesus say? He said, if you're faithful with little here, I'll make your ruler over much, yeah. uh, not only here, but also in the life to come. And so if all we're going to do is be singing with angels and sitting around a throne, uh, you know, on hearts and walking golden streets and, and all the mess that we used to sing in the quartet services and, and our hymn books and everything else. And what are we going to rule and reign? You know, what, what, what are we going to do? Cause I, I'm a man. And as a man, I want to build something. I want to do something. I want to know that for all of eternity, I don't want to just sit around singing. And I love the presence of God. You know, I'm, right, I, right. I, I, I'm worshiping with the saints, but that's it like forever and ever and ever. And so I'll begin to realize there's got to be a lot more than what we've been looking you know, at. Go ahead. And I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you um, to, to be saved 
uh, to be to so we can rule and reign in heaven where everything is already deemed to be perfect regardless of a person's view of heaven right. it's de deemed to be perfect all peace everything's serene what are we going to rule and reign over and you know it's like here in romans 1 16 paul uses the word in the english our english bible salvation uh you already said it's as uh, soteria or, or soteria uh and and the the number one meaning uh of salvation is rescue so so we're being rescued. What are we being rescued? What did this eternal Christ come into our reality and rescue us from? I think a lot of times he rescued us from ourselves so that we can sure. start thinking like him and, you know, hey, living a better life. Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to be I tend to be more on the Eastern Orthodox side of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Church of the West tends to focus more on ontological issues and sin. So they would say he came to rescue us from sin. And so mm -hmm. the Western church tends to put the focus on the cross or the Eastern church tends to put the focus on the resurrection because they believe the biggest, pro what Adam brought into the world was death. And mm -hmm. according, and again, according to Hebrews two, uh, you know, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus came, destroyed the works of the devil, rendered him completely powerless, took the keys, and then freed all of us from the fear of death. And, and, and I think that's a part, yes, I think that's a part that a lot of times we don't deal with uh, when it comes to the preaching of the gospel. I think we, we deal all with the idea of the forgiveness of sins and all of that, but you know, we also know Jesus was forgiving sins before the cross. So you know, God didn't need the blood to forgive sins. The blood was to deal with the law, according to, according to Hebrews. And, and so, you know, to me, the, the issue was more about the more about what death brought into the world. You know, Adam Adam allowed death to begin to come into this world, and Jesus came as the last Adam to defeat death once and for all and to remove from us any fear of death so that we we're not afraid of anything. And so I, I think the, the gospel is the good news. Of, I mean, think of this. Jesus standing at Caesarea Philippi in, in front of the gate of Hades or the gate of Sheol, the gate of hell, and he stands mm -hmm. up and he tells his disciples, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of Sheol, or the gates of the grave will not stand against it. He wasn't talking about demons and devils coming against us because they've never been Come in on. hell. I mean, I mean, hell's not their headquarters. I mean, you know, let alone what they even are, and I didn't want to get into that discussion. That's, 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 a, that's a whole other discussion. And uh, everybody wants to fight about that right now, and I'm like, yeah, it don't even matter to me. Uh, but, but you know, you. he's standing there the gate of the grave and he's telling his disciples listen even if they kill you you're not going to die all right you know I'm, I'm removing from you the fear of death the gates of the grave will not come against you and you have to stop being afraid of dying because the truth is when he died you already died anyway if he's raised you've already raised so you can't kill a dead man as it is anyway and so uh, for me again the, the the gospel the way it was presented and the way really i presented it was just you know now you get to get saved so you can go to heaven you can go to heaven with jesus but why would paul want to come tell people that already knew that that he wanted to preach more of that and this is what i found in my study is there's literally seven different things that's called the mm -hmm. gospel new testament uh you know i i, I call it one gospel because I, I don't call it a bunch of different gospels i don't believe it's a different gospel i think it's one gospel but seven dimensions, if you may, which of course we know seven is the number of, of completion, the number of perfection. It would make sense that right. it would, it would be seven, and uh, you know it's it's the gospel, uh, the gospel of God, the gospel of the dear Son, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Paul, the gospel of peace, the gospel of grace, and the gospel of the kingdom. All seven of those are actually called the good news. It's the good news of God. That's the good news of a sovereign. Lord and master. He's ruler over all. He's ruler over the universe. He is he is sovereign, but he's not in control. You know, he's 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 the one that if the earth is Lord's in the fullness thereof, the gospel of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the anointed one working in the believer, uh, that this is more than just you know one little part. Uh, the gospel of grace, you know, that's the foundation. If you don't understand the grace of God, I mean, how in the world did all this happen in the first place? You know, uh, the gospel mm -hmm. of peace. I think, I think most most leaders 
have no clue about the gospel of peace because most preachers are all fighting with each other and they're all fighting over doctrine and we don't comprehend at all the gospel. Yeah, no peace in that. No, and <laughs> you know, how, 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 I, how I've, how I've kind of come to explain it uh, also is this, you know, I, I grew up classical Pentecostal and yeah. you know, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and even still to this day, you know, when you have, uh, there'll be a church, it'll be a Pentecostal church. And it'll either be called full gospel church or it'll say something, something church. And underneath that, it, it'll say a full gospel church. And, right. and pretty much all that meant that, you know, we believe what the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and all them believed, but we added tongues and miracles to it. I, I, mean, I mean, that's really all the <laughs> gospel meant. Because when I was raised full gospel, we didn't understand the gospel of grace because the only grace we understood was the grace to initially accept Jesus. And then after that, man, it's not grace to live. It was, you know, you had, you had to work your tail off. Uh, you, you were exhausting yeah. yourself, wearing yourself out to try to stay saved just so you could finally go to heaven someday. You know, I remember. Oh yeah, man. I mean, that was, you know, I mean, I've messed with people lately and I said, listen, you know, you don't just go to heaven when you die. You went to heaven when Jesus died. All right. Mm -hmm. So you know, stop freaking out about the heaven issue. Jesus dealt with the heaven issue 2000 years ago. Because when he died, we all died. When he was raised, we were all raised. When he was seated, we were all seated. So we need to stop freaking out about whether we're going to get into heaven or not. This is not an issue of us getting there. It's an issue of how much of there begins to manifest through us here. And and uh, and that that to me is like, you know, we understood didn't understand the gospel of grace, but we understood the gospel of Christ. I mean, as a Pentecostal, and all we preached oh, yeah. about was the power of the Holy Spirit and the believer empowering you strengthening we preach about the gospel of god he's lord and king and master and he's sovereign but uh you know we didn't understand uh we didn't understand the gospel of grace but then i go to a lot of grace churches in the quote unquote mm -hmm. grace movement and in the great in the grace movement if you ask people what's the gospel and they will tell you well the gospel of grace and i always say and and they're like no that's it i mean it's it, it's just grace. That's all there is. It's the gospel of grace. And and what happens is this, is when people only preach the gospel of grace, then you have what I call as kumbaya congregations. You know, you got a bunch of Barney theology. I love you. You love me. We're a happy yeah. family. And a bunch of people, say, well, I'm saying I'm accepted. You're accepted. I'm loved. You're loved. I'm in the beloved. You're in the beloved. But then they're not doing any social justice. They're not they're not, they're not digging wells uh, in third world countries. They're not feeding the poor. They're not caring for widows and orphans. Uh, they're not demonstrating the kingdom out in the streets. It's just, hey, we're good because we're all here together. And then most of the people preaching grace don't preach the gospel of peace because the people that begin to preach grace, most of them came out of legalism and they stopped being a legalist, but then they just became a gracist because now they're fighting all the legalists. And, and exactly. ends up you know, then... We end up being we we end up being religious about not being religious, but then it's it's still the same attitude and the same spirit. But then hardly any of those groups understand the gospel of the kingdom because their eschatology still has you know the kingdom three miles south of Mars somewhere on the way here through the Hubble telescope, and that you know it's someday they're waiting for a marriage supper with a lamb and waiting to go to heaven. They're they're waiting for everything that that we understand has been fulfilled already in Christ, as well as in the first century. And so once you get a hold of that, it's like, okay, then what, what's all this about? And, and, and I think part of the confusion, and, and this is something I, I teach literally all over the world as I travel, and, and uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm sure other people have taught it. I've just not heard a lot of people hit it from this angle. That is that I believe that we've misunderstood what it means to inherit the kingdom. Uh, I mean, think of this, uh, you know, when I was growing up, probably when you were growing up, denominations we came out of in, in movements, whenever mm -hmm. we heard verses like liars, thieves, fornicators uh, will not inherit the kingdom, our mind would immediately go to, oh, you're not getting into heaven. But the problem with that is you don't get an inheritance after you die. You get an inheritance while you're still living because someone else died. And so inheriting the kingdom has nothing to do with getting into heaven. It, it, it's about receiving now righteousness, peace, yeah. because yeah. I mean, the book of Revelation tells us lots of thieves and fornicators don't inherit the kingdom. And, you know, we're like, oh, yeah, you know, they're not getting in. But then it also says the fearful, phobos, that means anybody that has a phobia, anybody that's afraid of spiders or, or mice Come or bats, they're not, not going to get in. That's ridiculous. <laughs> 
But then it says divination will not inherit the kingdom. That's the Greek word pharmakia. So any of us that are taking any pharmaceutical drugs, I guess that disqualifies us. Then it says heresies will not inherit the kingdom, which heretic is translated one who gives his own self-willed opinion. So that just took <laughs> including you and I, you know, and, and so, yeah. you know, obviously our behavior has nothing to do with whether we get into heaven. Believing in Jesus completely took care of the heaven issue and what Jesus did in his finished work took care of the heaven issue So it's mm -hmm. not about me doing things to earn heaven It's about my behavior is still important and I think I think you know Paul dealt with the works of the flesh compared to, uh, Walking in the spirit he dealt with our behavior I mean Ephesians 1 2 and 3 is all about the gospel of grace. This is what God did for you and as you in Christ Jesus. But then he gets to chapter four and he's like, now little children, you know, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Put on the full armor of God. In other words, this is how you now live your life now that you've understood this and behavior is still important, but behavior doesn't determine whether you get into heaven. Your behavior has everything to do with how much of heaven is going to demonstrate through you here. Because if I'm lying to my neighbor, if I'm stealing from my neighbor, if I'm sleeping with my neighbor's wife, and I try to bring the kingdom of heaven, I try to bring righteousness, peace, and joy to my neighbor, my neighbor's not going to pay attention to anything I say because my behavior has disqualified me from bringing but, him. But here's the problem uh, with our with the grace movement today, and I'm not saying this is like all the way across the board, but with a lot of things we're hearing, that everything has been fulfilled, it's done. We no longer have to avoid sexual sins or committing various crimes because we have grace and we're even beyond the bible because we don't need anybody to tell us anything holy spirit teaches us all things without realizing that holy spirit speaks through people to teach us all things and and so now we've totally become devoid of moral responsibility because we have grace and you're saying pretty much the opposite <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I tra you know, I travel pretty extensively and sure. I, I go in and out of so many different movements, denominations, cultures, backgrounds. And, and, and what, what I find a lot of times is this, is that people, uh, you know, they'll, they'll sit around and watch Joe's the Prince. You know, he's got a great revelation on grace and, and sure. he'll say, it's not what you do, do, do. Uh, it's what he's done, done, done. And that's true when. To, uh, receiving our salvation when it comes to uh, uh, us receiving the kingdom. That's absolutely true. There's, I can't earn that. There's nothing I can do to deserve that. It's everything that he's done. But, but then at the same time, you know, people forget that, you know, Joseph has a massive church with a massive volunteer force, and he's not standing up there saying, now you don't have to do anything, because in order to be able to function in the ministry they have, there's a lot of people that are involved, because I think what happens is when we come from a works-based background and we get a revelation of we're not saved by works, then right. we throw all works out the door. You know, we forget yeah. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, yeah, we're not saved by works, but we are saved for good works that he preordained from the foundation of the world. And so Absolutely. he's very uh, you know, there's over over 15 uh, verses in the New Testament that talks really about like works of grace. Paul said, I labored more than all the other apostles by, by the grace of God. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, man, I worked harder than everybody. And I guess for me, uh, I've run into a lot of people that when they've gotten a revelation of grace after coming out of a lot of law, mixture, and legalism, now they don't want to give anymore because they, they find out, hey, you know, Malachi 3 don't have anything to do with me. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, the new covenant is about giving, yeah, lavish giving. You know, it's not it's not about a, a, an obligatory tithe. And, and but then all of a sudden, people that tithe for thirty years get a revelation that they don't have to act, have to they don't have to, and their car's not going to break down if they don't tithe, and uh, you know, they're not going to get cancer if they don't tithe, and they're not going to be under a curse. But then all of a sudden, they don't want to give anything. You know, and then uh, they realize I don't have to do all this stuff, but then they don't want to serve at all. And I get it because we came from a lot of systems that, that made us slaves rather than rather than produce sonship in us. And rather right. than pull out of us what our passion is, we were kind of made to do stuff that we didn't even want to do and we didn't even enjoy doing. But we were just told this is what you have to do as a Christian. And, and I, I get where people come from. But, you know, I always put it like this. 
you know, it's not what we do, do, do. It's what he's done, done, done. But then now you can't get anybody to do, do, do anything, you know? And so churches are yeah. struggling all over the place because people don't volunteer right. anymore. They don't, they don't want to give anymore because it's like, hey, because if you bring up the word work, all of, you know, all, all of a sudden when you bring up the word work, you get in a lot of the grace movement and that's a cuss word because it's a four letter mm -hmm. word. You know? And they're mm -hmm. like, listen, don't, don't, don't put, you're trying to put me under works. So it's like, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to put you under works, but I am trying to give you a picture. I, I, I think an amazing picture uh, is Thomas. You know, Thomas, uh, Thomas says, you know, until I see Jesus, I'm not going to believe. And so Jesus walks through the door and uh, he walks up to Thomas and he said, Thomas, he said, uh, let me show you my hands. And he says, put your hand in the holes in my hand. In other words, your hand deals with your, your work and your labor. He said, I want you to submit all of your works to my finished work. This is this is my work. This is what I did. I want you to submit all your sweat and labor now. I want you to put your hand in my hand uh, to now realize that I did the work. But then the next thing he has him do, he says, now he opens up his robe and he said, put your hand in my side. In other words, now I want you to find your work. I want you to find the work in the body that I've called you to do. Mm -hmm. Because the, purpose for you have giftings you have callings you have graces there's something you're called to do but if all we do is preach the gospel of grace what i found is it produces it produces uh, a lot of lazy believers um it, it produces people uh that 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 love jesus and they're going to heaven that's 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 so far from the issue it's ridiculous uh, but then they, they don't step into purpose. They don't step into the destiny. That's why I've been saying for the last 10, 15 years that the gospel of grace must be coupled with the preaching of the gospel of the dear son or sonship. Because uh, uh, what grace does, I, I, I like to put it in three, three dimensions. Grace, the gospel of grace and the gospel of Paul are foundational. Uh, that's understanding our righteousness in him and that our righteousness was before we ever prayed a prayer. Uh, you know, Romans 5, because of one man's unrighteous deed, all were made unrighteous. But now because of one man's righteous deed, all have been justified, all are made righteous. So the gospel of Paul is actually announcing to people, not that they're sinners, but it's announcing you're actually a son Come and on. you're actually righteous. All right. Come on. Not the sin in people, but preaching to the son in people. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, whenever Paul preached about sin, it was, it was to sons who already knew they were sons. It wasn't to the world. I mean, he, you know, he wasn't pointing out. Uh, uh, all the sin to all the pagans on Mars Hill. He's telling them, hey, we're all God's offspring and he, we all come from one blood and him you live and move and have your being or you're already in Christ. You just don't know you're in Christ. Exactly. But then when he did that with, uh, that's why Paul's not to judge those that are without, but we are to judge those that are within. You know, but when it came to dealing with the churches, Paul's like, listen, guys, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you as the beloved. I'm, you know, he would remind them of their sonship. And then he start breaking into, listen, man, you guys, you guys got a leader in the church who's sleeping with a stepmother and y'all are acting like it's okay. You know, y'all are like, Hey, we're under grace. It's all cool. And pagans in town think you all have lost your mind. You know, it's like, man, right. I mean, when, when pagans think you're crazy, you know, I mean, man, there, there's a serious issue there. And so Paul, you know, Paul would deal with the issues in the body. Because if you don't preach sonship, sonship is what causes us to become accountable. I'm, 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 avail I'm available for kingdom purpose and kingdom service. Because I like to put it like this, and, and you pretty much alluded to it a minute ago. The work of Jesus was finished 2,000 years ago at the cross. Right. But the work of the church and the work of the kingdom was not. Uh, the, the work of the church and the kingdom is not finished. It's not completed. It is something that we are still demonstrating. We're still appropriating. We're still manifesting. Jesus said the kingdom is like leaven, and, it's, and the, that leaven's going to leaven the whole lump. Of his government and peace, there will be no end. So the kingdom right. has been expanding for a thousand years, and everything we need is already purchased for us. Everything we, are, everything we need for life and godliness we already have. But now, now it's that time uh, to where I also think if we don't preach the gospel of the kingdom, to me, the gospel of the kingdom is what makes us responsible. That's when we begin to realize, as a son, I'm accountable with the grace that God has given me. So I hear the gospel of grace. I hear the gospel of Paul. And then I also realize I need to hear the gospel of Christ because I need to realize the Holy Spirit is living in me and he's empowering me. He's strengthening me by his grace, able to. 
and not and to live righteously and to live holy. All of a sudden, it's like, you know, if you if you say to grace people uh, anything about righteousness and holiness, all of a sudden you turn into a legalist again. And it's like, that, sure. that has nothing to do with legalism and nothing to do with the good news. It's the good news of the anointed one by the power of the Holy Spirit that's living inside you. And he wants to empower you and strengthen you and, and anoint you as the son so that you're also accountable to the grace that you're carrying to realize that then, it is the gospel of the kingdom that makes us responsible sons because we're here for a purpose. Yeah, you know, and Paul uh, said in in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he talked about his, his the persuasiveness, uh, uh, the, not using persuasive words for his preaching and teaching, but he said, you know, demonstration. And you mentioned that, that, that to demonstrate the kingdom, it's not how much of the kingdom you're going to obtain, but it's how much of the kingdom you understand here and now so that you can live a life of demonstrating the kingdom. And really you're demonstrating the, 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 the whole mindset of the Godhead to the world. I love what you said that people uh, uh, are, are uh, the offspring of God, but they just don't know it yet. And so someone said, well, then why do we need to be here? Now, why do we need to stay if everybody's the offspring of God? Well, it's real simple because there are people who haven't awakened to that yet, and well, we need to help awaken them. Well, I mean, that, that's why the that's why gospel is translated good news. Amen. You know, good news is not God can't stand you. Truth is, He wants to throw you, he wants to throw you into hell, and He wants to fry you, and you got to hurry up. And and you're just, you know, as Martin Luther said, he said, "All we are is snow covered dung." You know, you're just a piece of poo. I mean, even though you're in the image and likeness of God, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're just a piece of poo that God don't really like. And once you get in Jesus, because, you know, it's almost like we've interpreted that, that, that we're hid from God in Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than, rather than our life is hid, you know, with Christ in God. It's not, we're not hid from God, you know, as, as some famous Calvinists have said today, uh, you know, uh, in, in, our, in our country. That, you know, all Jesus is, is you accept Jesus and he is your asbestos suit that protects you against the white hot fire wrath of God. You know, that, that, that's not good news. I mean, there's no good news at all. And the God wants to just fry your behind because he doesn't really like you. But when you understand yeah. that God was in Christ reconciling the world, which means to be brought into favor, and he's not counting your sins against you. I mean, I mean, when I get on airplanes and when I share the gospel with waiters and waitresses, because I'm in, you know, and uh, I'm in hotels and restaurants all the time. I mean, I inform them. I inform them of their. I inform them of their of their sonship. You know, it's not my job to to tell them about all of their mess and all their issues. People already know what oh, their right. issues are. They already know how how their how their. Uh, I, I like to explain it like this. This is how the gospels kind of got simplified to me in the last couple of years. Uh, imagine someone lives 70 years of their life and they live as an orphan. They live in poverty. Uh, they're in sickness. They're in all kinds of, of bondage. They pretty much are living in a pig pen in life. And at 70 years old, someone informs them that they have a father that they knew nothing about who has been searching for them and looking for them, a father who loves them and a father who, who has had $20 million sitting in an account that would take care of everything they would need for life, but but they didn't know it. And so they lived alienated from their father because they didn't know they were a son, and so they lived like an orphan. And so really, right. gospel is more of an announcement that, that you know, you, you are already sons of God, you know? And of course, the only argument I have on that is people always bring up First John, where, you know, John says that if you still sin, uh, then you're a son of the devil. But then, you know, we don't read it in context because what it is, Sin, according to First John, and John said transgressing the law, and of course none of us on this side of the cross have ever been under law, and so you know what is sons of the devil? The devil does not have a reproductive organ, all right. You know, I mean, he he's a perverter, can't pr reproduce anything, and and uh, you know it's so silly. Sons of the devil are just sons of the law, sons of the accuser. Uh, you know, you are your father, the devil. Jesus said they they weren't literally demon seed. Every human is the offspring right. of God. And that offspring, genos, is the Greek word. It comes from right. the original word kin. You know, you live in southern Missouri, and folks in Missouri know what kin is. You know, fo folks in the south, uh, you know, and he's like, listen, man, we're all God's family. We're all his children. Ephesians 3, he's the God and father of every family, named in heaven and named in earth. I mean, that's always been God's heart. So the gospel is an announcement, letting sons 
know that they're sons, but there's two types of sons. There's sons who have heard it and believed it and appropriate it. And there are sons that are still living in the pig pen, uh, alienated from their father because they don't know their sons. And so the beauty yeah. of the gospel is we just come and we announce to people the gospel of grace and the gospel of Paul announces their sonship to them. But then once they believe that and they begin to walk in that sonship, there's then an accountability that takes place also, because as a son, this is how you live your life. This is how you order your life. And, and Paul's epistles are full of instructions uh, to how yeah. we live, you know, and it's almost like for some reason, I feel like the last 10, 15 years, a lot of that and some movements have just got thrown out the door and it's like, we don't even talk about it anymore. And, and, and that's, that's just out of order. Yeah. And, and, you know, I appreciate you bringing up, even though you didn't really say it, the analogy of the prodigal son, because you have a father and you have two sons. They're both the offspring of the father. You could even say they're both the creation of the father. Absolutely. One one knew it. One didn't know it. One embraced it. One yep. didn't embrace it. And and of course, we know the conflict there in that whole picture. But but what a beautiful picture of how much the father loves all of his children, even those yep. who realize what they have and those who don't realize what they have. Right. Well, and, and for me, uh, I don't I don't know why I've tried to actually find. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of books out there. I've just not really found a lot on the mystery hidden from the ages. You know, I mean, Paul tells us in Colossians, he said a mystery that's been hidden from the ages. I mean, that should cause every preacher at least to perk their ears up and say, man, what's this? And he says, the mystery is to the Gentiles. In other words, it was a mystery to those not a part of this Jewish law and covenant. And the mystery is Christ in you, the hope that's of it. glory. Not Christ to you, but Christ that's in you. It. In other words, the, the gospel is an announcement of not inviting Jesus into your heart. It's an announcement that Jesus is already in your heart, but you have a veil in the way. And anyone that turns to Christ, the veil is removed. It's a veil over our mind and our heart. And once the veil is removed, then Christ is revealed in you. I mean, Paul even says about his Damascus Road experience. He said, you know, man, when Christ was revealed to me, he said, I didn't go to the apostles. I went out in the wilderness. He said, for when I was on that Damascus Road, Christ was revealed in me. I didn't say Christ was revealed to me, you know? So I, I think what we've done is we've, we've tried to get Christ to people rather than reveal Christ in people. Absolutely. Of and of course that word glory, and man, I've, I've shared this now for years, the word glory, dox Greek is actually yeah. translated honor, value, worth, and approval. So, yeah. you know, the message to the Gentiles is Christ in you, the hope of, Honor, value, worth, and approval. In other words, you're already approved. You're valuable. You're worth something. Come on. You're not snow covered dung. You're not a dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking sinner that God wants to throw to hell in a basket. I mean, th think of how Jesus declared the good news. You know, Jesus would see Zacchaeus up in a tree, and and he didn't say he, Jesus wasn't a street preacher. He didn't say you filthy, rotten little heathen. You're going to hell in a handbasket. Get, get get down here and repent right now. Instead, he just says, hey, Zach, I must come to your house. You know, and you know, in Eastern culture, when you were willing to go to somebody's house, that was a big deal. You just didn't have, you just didn't go to anybody's house because that means you would receive them for everything they were and everything they had. Jesus sees uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel had just under a tree had said, uh, he's a false messiah like all these other ones. But when he walks up to Jesus, Jesus exposes a son in him and he says, behold, Nathaniel, a man in whom there is no guile. He, he doesn't focus on his issue. He focuses on who he is. He meets Peter and he says, you are Simon, but you shall be Peter. In other words, mm -hmm. I see something in you. I see a son in you that you don't see in yourself. The gospel, exactly. an amazing proclamation. And again, that's the gospel of Paul. Yeah. The gospel of Paul is announcing sonship in people. It's not trying to get people to become sons. It's announcing the idea. It's why Paul said, awake to righteousness and sin not. He didn't say stop sinning and then awake to righteousness. In other words, awake to the fact that you've already been made righteous because that's what Jesus did for you and as you. That's a done deal. But until you awaken to that reality, until you have your, uh, you know, whatever whatever you want to call it. I mean, people call it born again. They call it salvation. They call it awakening, epiphany. Uh, I don't care. You know, it's, it's an experience. I mean, something exactly. happens when you believe because you're a different person afterwards. Because again, to me, what happens is the veil is removed. 
uh, that, 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 that is over our, over our hearts and our minds. And when the veil is out of the way, then Christ, who's always been in the temple, because he's above all, through all, and in all. I mean, he's never, he's never not been in you. Man, you're think? jumping on all of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, you know what I've always wondered, and I'd like to get your take on this, and not, not to, to steer us in another direction, but I think this will chime in. When, when Saul was on the road to Damascus, and for me, time literally stands still. The bright light shines. You know, the, the guards around are not uh, hearing but are, are seeing what's going on. But but Paul has this Saul has this encounter. Yeah. What do you think happened in that moment? Um, I mean, obviously, we don't really know. You know, I mean, I mean, the, the only thing uh, that we do know is what Paul said. Christ was revealed in him. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there was a literal literal vision and shining light. You know, I guess I always had a picture of him riding a big white steed, which the truth is, you know, I mean, over in Israel, he's probably riding a, riding a donkey, you know, or, or walking. And, you know, it just always sounded good to say God knocked him off his high horse, you know. I mean, it just always sounds <laughs> when you're preaching. It just sounds easy, you know, to say that. But, you know, it could have been just because it says it was minded, you know. And then, of course, and Ananias, you know, came and, and prayed for him and his eyes were open. Uh, but I think sometimes, you know, you're back in the 90s, I preached a series of messages called uh, Blind Enough to See. You know, I, I think sometimes it, it, it always seemed like it was the blind that knew who Jesus was. You know, it was a blind man who shouted out son of David, which is a messianic term. Everyone else was just saying he's a great prophet. He's a great man. But it's Bartimaeus that actually calls him son of David and, and, and sees him as the Messiah, even though he was blind. I, I think sometimes we almost have to be blinded to some things for us to be able to really see, uh, you know, it, it's like when Jesus, uh, when Jesus healed the one blind man, and then he said to me, so what do you see? He said, I see men walking as trees. Right. You know, right. I've heard so many sermons uh, called the second touch that Jesus couldn't heal him the first time. So he had to pray, which obviously could heal him the first time. I personally believe it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the physical healing. I believe Jesus gave him spiritual sight, then gave him his natural sight. Because who were the men walking around as trees? That was the Pharisees and all the religious people that were with Jesus trying uh, trying to uh, trap him. And trees don't walk. Trees are rooted. They're planted. And, and these were a bunch of people that were not rooted and grounded in love. They were not rooted and grounded in the gospel. And he's like, yeah. you know what? Sometimes I want to give you spiritual sight to what religion produces, uh, you know, before I actually give you your natural sight. And so I think, yeah. I, I think, I think maybe Paul because of so much religion and so much law, and he was a master at it, that he almost had to be blinded to see, you know, but ultimately he said, Christ has revealed in me. And, and you know what amazes me about this, Dr. Bill? I mean, the people that fight me the most when I share that are grace people. Yeah. For some reason, I mean, I'll, I'll go share that in the Pentecostal church and people will be like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. And, and, and Baptists love it. They're, they just gobble it all up. But I mean, when I get around grace folks, they're like, no, no, they're sons of God and sons of the devil. And you're not a son of God until you pray the prayer, until you get born again. And and, and I'm like, are, are you kidding me? I mean, there's so many verses. I mean, John 1, you know, in him was the light of all men. I mean, I mean, he's the light. You have no life outside of God. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that you have to invite God into your heart. Now, you believe in your heart. But actually, there's no verse anywhere in the scripture. I mean, it's, it's the one the one thing, you know, my, last time I was on, we discussed my book on 70 myths yeah. in translation. Right. And I said the one thing that, that I didn't put in that book that I wish I would have was to me probably one of the number one myths. And that is uh, that you have to invite Jesus into your heart, you know. And I mean, there, there's no verse for that anywhere in the Bible that you invite him into your heart. It just says you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And so I, yeah. I think. I, I, I think uh, just so much, this, uh, you know, back to the gospel. I think it's what Paul, I think it's what Paul was saying to the church at Rome. when he said, I've been longing to come to you so I can preach the gospel to you. And, and let's be honest, most movements, most denominations, most groups, they preach maybe three or four, maybe five of those seven. But a lot of times there's always two or three that they leave out. Uh, or they might just barely tap into it here or there. For me, uh, you know, the gospel of peace was the last 
peace for me. I, I understood the gospel of the kingdom years ago. I understood the gospel of the dear son. Sonship, well, I mean, I cut my teeth on the message of sonship. Uh, you know, the gospel of God, I was raised with God as Lord, a master and sovereign. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the gospel of, of grace uh, came a little bit later in my life. But then the gospel of peace has probably been the last piece for me to, for, to fill my life because I have no comprehension hardly, you know, what Jesus came to bring. He didn't come to bring war and fighting and, and you know, Rambo Jesus is not coming back in the future you know, to slaughter all of humanity. He's the prince of peace. You know, I remember it was so funny. I was telling a pastor that I was with this past week that my, my kids, uh, both my children, they, you know, all they know is the kingdom. They weren't raised on any uh, uh, pre-tribulation rapture. They weren't, they weren't raised. Uh, they were raised in the message of the kingdom. And mm-hmm. so uh, my daughter, she was about 15. She's 25 now. So it was about 10 years ago. And she wanted to watch uh, Left Behind. You know, I mean, it, it, it had like come up on our, on our on demand and, and she said, Dad, I've had friends of mine talking about it. You know, I know you think it's, you know, a load of baloney, but uh, I'd like to watch a movie. I said, okay, we'll rent it. I'll watch it with you. And it was the latest one. It was the Hollywood one with Nicolas Cage. So, I mean, at least it wasn't as cheesy as some of the other ones. But uh, we're 20 minutes into the movie. And I'm sitting on the couch with my daughter sitting in the chair. And the rapture just happens. And planes are crashing and buses are, are, are crashing and trains are going off tracks and cars and, and parents are walking around confused and dazed saying, where's my baby? Has anybody seen my baby? And all of a sudden a pillow hits the TV. And I look over at my daughter and she's standing up screaming at the TV. She's like, are you kidding me? These people believe that our Jesus the peace, is going to cause this kind of chaos and this kind. And I mean, it, it caused me to laugh so hard because, you know, I was raised in that fear. You know, I mean, I'd come home from school and, you know, if my parents weren't weren't home, I'd get nervous and then I'd run over next door to the church. And if they weren't there, then I really thought I'd miss the rapture. And I, <laughs> I was raised in incredible, incredible fear. But for me, the gospel of peace is what Jesus came to proclaim. He came to proclaim peace on earth, goodwill towards all men. And I think even in the church world, uh, we're so missing out on the gospel of peace because all the groups tend to all fight with each other and get angry. And, and it's so difficult not to sometimes, sometimes we hear something dumb and stupid that's putting people into ignorance and fear and bondage. And it's so easy to jump out and attack it without realizing also, you know, these are also my brothers and I fail at that all the time. But I, I know the one thing God is constantly dealing with me about is this gospel of peace because that that's part of that accountability. But then man, the, the, the kingdom, and we're, we're here for a purpose. We're here uh, to see heaven demonstrated on earth. We're here Amen. to see life changed. We're here, we're here to make a difference. We're here to be agents of change. We're not here to just sit around enjoying life and just, you know, I'm good, you're good. Uh, we're here for divine purpose. Let me ask you a question. This gospel of peace, uh, since you've come face to face with this, this uh, gospel of peace, how has that brought forth um, how has that manifested in your everyday life in a day-to-day understanding of it? Well, it's, to be honest, it's caused me, you know, I, I was raised in a town in Michigan. Okay. That, uh, uh, I don't know, have you ever heard of the tough man contest? I mean, yeah. it was, yeah, it was a, a, a national thing they had its own TV program for a while. Well, that was started in my town. All right, a man by the name of Art Door. I mean, Art Door pretty much runs Bay City, Michigan. Bay right. City has, has more bars per capita than any city in the world. Uh, and pretty much all people did in Bay City was get drunk and fight. I mean, it was it really, it, it was a bunch of lumberjacks, actually. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Bunyan, you know, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. The, right, right. That was actually based on a story of a man by the name of Babe LaFromboise, who was like a seven foot three, 400 pound logger. Was a known brawler, and it's a very inter- interesting story. But I mean, I graduated from high school with a bunch of little from boys because it's all you know the family line now. Years years later, uh, but it was it was all a bunch of loggers and lumbermen that were just rough and tough. And so you know, even even my Christian life, that whole attitude of the town that I was raised in, uh, began to manifest in my Christianity. 
And, you know, I mean, I loved all the warfare scriptures because, I mean, my, my favorite yeah. verse was the kingdom of violence and the violent taken by force. <laughs> you know, you that that's not, that's a horrible translation of that, but that's not what it's talking about. You know, we, we don't, we know the, the church is not here for dominion through, uh, through force and through empire and through, and through fighting. We take dominion through love and service. And, and the world got turned upside down because the New Testament church, you know, I mean, I remember reading this several years ago that the Romans actually thought the people of the way that Christians were a sex cult because of how much love they demonstrated. They would greet each other with kisses. They were hugging on each other all the time. I mean, let's be honest, most of the body of Christ around, in America, especially, would probably never be considered anything near a sex cult because most you got churches across the street from each other fighting with each other. We're all fighting over right. doctrine. And what it, what, what it really did for me was, you know, for years I was a fighter and really God took me on this journey to turn me into a lover. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been a long road for me because I mean, I, I, I liked the fight, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big guy. I've got this voice that tends to be a little scratchy and intimidating. <laughs> And there was times in my younger years I enjoyed being that guy, but now I, I, I just want people, I want people to feel safe with me, you know. I mean, I, right. I, I, I want, I want, I want someone who knows nothing about God, uh, uh, you know, maybe sitting around stoned on drugs, being able to sit down next to me, and they feel completely safe, where they don't feel, they don't feel any struggle in me uh, to try to change them transform them. I've said for years, you know, Jesus was a friend of sinners. And, and if he was a friend of sinners, uh, that means that not everybody that got around him changed. You know, it doesn't say right. he was a friend of ex sinners. That means Jesus had a lot of people around him that never believed in him, but he still loved them. He was still their friend. He demonstrated the gospel of peace everywhere that he went because he was the Prince of Peace. And so, you know, how that's worked in my own life is I just, if someone wants to fight with me, I just tell them you win. You know, I just, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have any desire, you know, and, and, and I think right. part of it, you know, J Jesus, you know, Pilate, Jesus is standing before Pilate and, and Pilate asked him a question. He said, you know, like, you know, are you a king? Are you this? And, uh, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of or from this world or it's Genesis does not come from this world. He said, for if it were, my servants would fight. In other words, and that word fight means to strive, to contend, to struggle. I mean, I remember when I studied that out, I was like, man, my first 15 years of my Christian life, let alone growing up in the church, was all a fight, striving, contending, and struggle. You know, you got to get a hold of yeah. the horns of the altar. It, everything was a struggle. Yeah. And, and when I realized that if, if we're actually understanding the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of this kingdom causes us to not fight. Because if my yeah. disciples were from this world, they would fight, strive, and contend. But because they're not, they don't. That's why That's why when Peter takes off the sword and cuts off Melchus's ear, Jesus gets all yeah. upset with him. You know, I mean, I mean, that passage bugged me for years because, you know, the, the chapter or two before, Jesus says, now listen, guys, in the past I told you, don't take extra clothes, don't take a sword, don't take any extra money, don't take any food, but now... I'm telling you, take extra clothes, take an extra script, and now bring a sword. And one of the disciples says to him, Master, we have two. You know, that, that passage bothered me for years. I'm like, well, what? I mean, he, he's telling 12, you know, now you can bring a sword. And one of the guys says, well, we have two of them. And Jesus says, that's enough. And I'm for years, that I'm, I'm like, well, enough for what? Until it took me years later. But when you actually study that out, you know, the Romans at every feast – There'd be over a million Jews that would come to celebrate and they would be marching through the streets singing the song of Moses, how God delivered him from their enemies. Well, you know, Pilate wouldn't, that would make Pilate very nervous. And so, you know, the Romans actually set a law that if you were, if you were a group of 10 or more uh, Jewish men and you had two swords or more, you could be arrested for collusion against the state. As Jesus says, we, they said, we have two. Jesus said, that's enough. For it must be fulfilled, as Isaiah said, that he must be numbered among the professors. And so all that was was to fulfill a prophecy. You know, we use it, uh, Christians love it to be able to say, you know, God was good with the Second Amendment. 
you know, I mean, God, you know, God's good, uh, you know, with with concealed carry and everything else. And you know, I don't think God cares if you carry a gun. But I know Christians that like, man, if someone breaks in my house, I'm going to shoot them right between the eyes. It's like, really? Right. I mean, you know, because that's what Jesus we would. You know, I mean, come on. I mean, you can you can wound them. You know, I mean, you can shoot them in a place that doesn't kill them. I, I mean, you know, when we have this mindset that that produces, it's the mindset of Peter. And Peter takes the sword, cuts off Malchus's ear, which, of course, Malchus means reigning king. And, and it's always Peter, Stone, it's preachers who have had a revelation of Jesus, but still struggling with the law and mixture that cut off your hearing. And it's Jesus, yeah. great truth, that constantly heals your hearing. And Jesus rebukes Peter. And he's like, listen, man. You know, I, I never told you to use the sword. I just told you to bring a sword, right? Because I had yeah. to be arrested. I had to go to the cross as a criminal so I could relate with the worst of all. Yeah. Right? And I had to fulfill this prophecy. I never told you to use it. And so I, I, to me, that's part of that, that, that gospel of peace is we have Christians that will absolutely freak out on the idea of abortion. But yet they're they're pro going to Iran and blowing people up, right? So we're 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 we're, we're pro life, we're pro life when it comes to in the womb, but uh, but not necessarily pro life to you know people that are already outside the womb, and so that that to me is part of the hypocrisy that the gospel of peace actually releases, and it, and it's not it's not uh, it's not saying that the gospel of peace also makes you a pacifist uh, either. Uh, you know, but it's, you know, if someone breaks in my house and they're trying to harm me and my family. I'm going to do everything I can to keep them from doing that, obviously. Right. You know, I mean, right. that's because that, that's a justice issue, uh, you know, but I, I think I think the demonstration of peace is what the church has been really pitiful at, to be honest with you. Yeah, you can you can execute justice and still have peace reign in your height. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Amen. Absolutely. And so, you know, to me, the, I, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm working on writing all this down in a book right now and actually expanding, you know, e each of those those seven gospels and kind of what it looks like and what they mean and and maybe maybe calling it something like a more complete gospel. Because I, I just think the gospel is something that we should preach to ourselves every day. You know, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the gospel is something you hear one time because there's so many aspects of the good news that we need to hear on a regular basis. We need to constantly hear about our sonship because that's who we are and what we have in Christ, that we are as Jesus is on the earth, that we're more than a conqueror because someone else already conquered for us, that our identity with him, our identification with him, we right. hear uh, you know, uh, uh, about the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is to be demonstrated in and through us and we're here as sons to be responsible for carrying that message everywhere we go. Amen. Amen. And let me just say to our audience tonight that as, as we're talking about these various uh, aspects or layers or concepts of the gospel, uh, oftentimes Paul talks about the gospel of Christ. Uh, and then we say, well, Paul had his own gospel. But but as you said from the start, pretty much there, they're, they're one and the same. It's just various plans and the gospel of peace i'm so loving this because in it this is what peace has done for me uh, uh, to the degree that i understand peace uh today is that i don't have to live in fear about anything i read in the scriptures anything i read in the news headlines such as the coronavirus that just is being broadcasted don't have to live in fear about that don't have to live in fear about uh doctors uh uh uh, uh uh, uh, assessments or anything we, we don't have to live in fear. it's great when you can hear a bad report and still have peace manifest in your heart because paul said that's the kingdom of god it, it's it's righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost and it, it's so important that we learn to manifest all of those in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis yeah absolutely and and again it's the power of god unto our wholeness mm -hmm. the power of unto our healing it's the power of god unto our completeness it's the power of god unto our prosperity uh you know the good news is the power and so uh you know if 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 the good news is the power of god into salvation it is beyond me why anybody would sit week after week in a church hearing bad news yeah <laughs> yeah and, and 
and that's not producing any wholeness in you, completeness in you. It's not producing deliverance. It's not producing healing. You know, why are you sitting there listening to bad news week after week after week? I'm not, I just, I, I don't get it. I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you so much. <laughs> and, and, and then people call that the gospel. And it's like, no, that's, that's not, you know, that's, that's, it's not the gospel. I mean, I, I, you know, John Calvin's idea of the gospel, I agree with John Wesley when he said that Calvin's God's worse than the devil. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea, you know, the idea that God would choose one and not choose another uh, when he loves everybody. You know, a uh, uh, part of the gospel of peace that I think is real unique, too. And, and man, God showed me this several years ago. You know, Jesus never told us to love his enemies. He told us to love our enemies. And maybe it's because he doesn't have any enemies. And how do we know that? Because no greater love is this than a man laid down his life for his friends. And he laid down his life for all. So he, he has no enemies. You know, the idea of God towards humanity, uh, that has always been a lie. God's, God's never been man's enemy. Man has been an enemy towards God because we've been enemies in our minds. But right, you know, Jesus right. was a friend of sinners. He was a friend of his enemies. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. Uh, he didn't have any real enemies, and neither does God. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous yeah. to even think like that. You know, he said, "You love your enemies because folks are going to have a problem with you." <laughs> you know, and yeah. uh, so I, I think that, I think that's extremely important to, to understand. You know, I happen to, happen to notice one of the things someone asked. You know, where, where Jesus said, "You live by the sword, you die by the sword," and Jesus also said, "You know that I that I that I came with a sword." Of course, that was that was a cutting towards the law. Uh, you know, that was uh, the axe is laid at the foot of the tree. Uh, that was that was him uh, dealing with the old religious mindset. Obviously, that wasn't him coming with a sword against any people. I mean, even the imagery of the book of Revelation, you know, where it's, it's talking about, uh, you know, him coming on a white horse. Uh, I mean, I heard people use that imagery for years and he's got like a sword in his hand because he's coming back to slaughter people. But it doesn't say that. It actually says he has a sword in his mouth which is the gospel. That's the good news coming out of his mouth and his blood right. is already on his vestments. That's not he killed a bunch of people. That's his own blood. And he's coming with a message to everyone uh, coming out of his mouth. The good news that his blood has already been shed. So yours doesn't have to be, you know? So, I mean, yeah. I mean, how, how we turn that into Rambo Jesus, you know, I mean, I mean, coming back yeah. on, on, a, on a white horse, slaughter everybody is absolutely beyond me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I, we are uh, at the top of the hour. I don't want to keep you all evening. I know you're a busy man, but I appreciate you so much. You know, you know, you have, you have dropped a lot of things tonight that we could, uh, uh, jump back and take them one by one and, yeah. uh, ex expunge those. I mean, it really a lot of good stuff. And there are things that people have questions about people want to know about. And that's why I appreciate what you do. Um, so, uh, Anyway, we will have you back on again, but uh, I want to just tell everybody real quickly that you can go to uh, connectinternationalministries.com, uh, uh, Bishop Jamie's website. Uh, you can find uh, information there uh, about um, how to connect. Uh, his itinerary uh, uh, events are there. Um, you can shop. You can find things that are available there. Uh, you even have a button for giving. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so, Bishop, and, and right now on, on my website right now, I have uh, my uh, my book in the ebook form, not the Kindle form, but an ebook form. I think it's only like three ninety nine on there right now. And then my audio book where uh, I, I, I read all 70 myths from my book and then gave five minute commentary on each one. And it's only like eight ninety nine right now and because uh, I've got it marked down. So, you know, if someone is interested in that, they could jump on there and check out my you know, check out my book. There's some fun stuff in there that'll definitely cause you to think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really enjoyed uh, going over the, uh, uh, some of the uh, 70 myths when we did the first show together. So uh, I am really looking forward to when you get this other book down and you talk about the seven uh, gospels. I, I really, really, that really intrigues me because there's so much that we are lacking and so much that we need to be able to share clearly with other people. Um, anything you like else you'd like to say in closing? No, I'll just thank you for having me. Uh, 
I'll always, always enjoy it. Love, uh, love being able to speak with you and, and everybody uh, connected to you. There's a lot of people connected to you that are also connected to me and, and vice yeah. versa. We kind of all have found each other. The, the beauty of social media that uh, we would have ne- probably never found each other 20 years ago. Uh, Absolutely. You know, at a conference or a service, but now we're all able to connect. Uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Amen. Amen. Well, um, yes, uh, uh, Apostle Daniel, I will uh, grab that. Uh, and I'm just, it's already on the shop link. So I'm just going to do it that way. Uh, this is Bishop Jamie's website. Um, and when you get there, there are other links that you can uh, click on uh, other tabs. And um, so please visit his website. Uh, please uh, click like and then share. Uh, so that other people can view this um, this uh, time together tonight. Uh, and we'll have Bishop Jamie back on another time. Uh, next week, uh, let's see, my, next week my, my guest is Dr. Glenn Hartline, who is a doctorate in veterinary medicine, also a doctorate in ministry. He is one of our professors in the university. He will be on with me, and we have some really great times sharing together. So thank you, Bishop Jamie. Thank you, everybody that has watched tonight, and uh, I'll post a reminder in the chat room afterwards to uh, to to uh, like and share this. And then also in about an hour or less, I will have the video done from YouTube and share it to my my Facebook page also. So thank you again, and stay right there. When we go offline, we'll still be on together, and we'll see everybody next time. Join us, uh, let's see, tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, Dr. Catherine Tune will be on with me as we finish the series on her book about love, and it's really been some interesting discussions. So we'll see everybody next time. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.